welcome to your midweek edition of CNN 10. I'm your host, Carl Azus. We're traveling all over Asia today, and our first story concerns a food shortage in North Korea. The country's population is just over 25 million people, and about 40% of them, we're talking about 10 million people, could be going hungry in the months ahead if they're not already. The United Nations says North Korea has just had its worst harvest in 10 years. There are a number of reasons why. The UN blames drought, flooding, and heat waves, a combination of the three. And the government of the United States blames North Korea's leadership as well, saying that if the communist country stopped spending so much on its nuclear and missile programs, its people wouldn't be as starved and neglected as they are. Is the current food shortage the beginning of a famine? The UN isn't calling it at this point. North Korea did suffer a widespread famine in the mid-1990s, and it was a time when anywhere from several hundred thousand to several million people died. This year, experts say there are a number of troubling signs concerning food in North Korea, but there are aid agencies and countries willing to help. North Korean farmers prepare the land for rice planting, a staple food in the country. This footage was filmed last month by the United Nations World Food Programme, one of the few aid groups allowed to operate in North Korea. It is warning that recent climate conditions mean 40% of the population are now in need of urgent food assistance. What is clear is that the succession of a bad drought, heat wave and floods this year has badly impacting the crop production. The report from WFP and the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization says those most at risk are young children and pregnant women. They warn of families being forced to cut meals or eat less. It's a warning that's being heard at the highest levels. President Trump spoke by phone to South Korean President Moon Jae-in last week and supported the South's desire to send humanitarian aid. It would have the effect of cracking open the door from the current stalemate in talks. President Trump expressed a total support in that regard. This, despite North Korea's suspected short-range ballistic missile tests earlier this month, a violation of UN resolutions. South Korea's Unification Ministry says they are working on a plan to send aid, but no specifics yet. North Koreans are going to start For some experts, concerns of food insecurity may be valid, but the extent of the crisis is unclear. Something bad is definitely happening. However, they should also keep in mind that food prices at free market, free food prices are stable. And it sort of does not agree with the idea of famine just about to erupt. WFP has 11 supported food factories in North Korea and provides nutritional assistance to some 770,000 malnourished women and children. Its report is based on information gathered during the assessment in country last month and in late 2018. But WFP does acknowledge some data is provided by North Korea itself. Experts fear that could be open to manipulation. The US has been sceptical of humanitarian aid for North Korea in the past because they say that Kim Jong-un is perfectly capable of feeding his own people. He just chooses to divert millions of dollars into his nuclear and missile program. But Trump's softening of that stance could signal a return to aid shipments as an incentive for Pyongyang to come back to the negotiating table. Paula Hancock, CNN Seoul. 10 second trivia. What is the only nation in the world that borders both Bangladesh and Pakistan? Afghanistan, China, India, or Nepal? Northwestern India borders Pakistan and Northeastern India borders Bangladesh. The end is in sight for India's marathon election. It began in early April. It lasts more than five weeks. It's carried out in several phases across the world's largest democracy, and that's why this is said to be the world's largest democratic exercise. The seventh and final stage of voting begins on Sunday. Results are expected to be announced on May 23rd, and that's when the nation's 1.3 billion people will know whether the incumbent prime minister will remain in power or if India's leadership will change. India is a densely populated country. In land area, it's a little over a third the size of the United States. But India's eligible voters alone number 900 million people. That's almost three times the size of the U.S. population. In addition to the challenges posed by an ongoing multi-phase election, there are issues of misinformation in the information age that are causing confusion and violence in the South Asian country. 
As India votes, a typical village scene in northern Uttar Pradesh state. A post-lunch huddle about who might win. These men are discussing the latest political news. Their main source? Messages and posts on Facebook and WhatsApp. WhatsApp use karte hain. We only use WhatsApp and Facebook. That's the internet for us. And with the election, my phone is flooded with political messages. Almost everyone we've spoken to in this village has a phone and they're often relying on the messages they see there, the politically themed videos and memes, to decide who gets their vote. It's their main source of news. The electoral battleground, it's in their hands. But the terrain is murky, littered with fake news that can sometimes prove fatal. Authorities here say fake rumours spread on WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook, triggered mob attacks that claimed more than a dozen lives in 2018. On, Experts on Indian politics are worried that during the elections, social media could be used to divide communities, or worse, trigger political violence. Facebook, already under scrutiny after the 2016 US presidential election, has set up this election war room in California. Sitting in Silicon Valley, these Facebook staffers are keeping a close eye on posts being seen by hundreds of millions of Indian voters. We're starting to see a wide variety of different tactics that people might be using to interfere with the elections. One of those that we've been investing a lot in our capabilities around is video or audio that might be altered um, to not be truthful. Indian police are also worried. This is just one of the many special units set up to monitor social media around the clock. And WhatsApp has launched a massive campaign to warn Indians about the threat of fake news. With more than 200 million users, this is the app's single biggest market. Back in Uttar Pradesh, the problem is clear. Voters say it's often hard to figure out which political message on social media is real and which is fake. We can't trust every message. We get a lot of fake messages. We just don't know what's true. Social media has become more than just a tool for mobilizing support. It's become a weapon for peddlers of misinformation. And voters like these often don't know what to believe. Nikhil Kumar, CNN, Uttar Pradesh, India. As we approach the 50th anniversary of when astronauts first walked on the moon, U.S. President Donald Trump says he's adding $1.6 billion to NASA's budget, in addition to the $21 billion the agency's already requested. The goal? To get people back to the moon by 2024. If that happens, they could have less surface to stand on, because the moon may be shrinking. Scientists have been studying pictures of the moon's surface from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, part of a half-billion-dollar mission that was launched in 2009. Researchers say they've seen thousands of cliffs scattered across the moon's surface, and that's led them to believe that it's slowly been shrinking over time, like the skin of a grape as it shrinks into a raisin. Scientists say this causes the moon's crust to break and form the cliffs, and that it also causes moonquakes, which aren't called earthquakes because moon. This has made the moon more than 160 feet skinnier, according to scientists, than it was when someone last set foot there in 1972. Some people think Starbucks is expensive. It ain't got nothing on this cup of coffee that's being sold at a coffee house in San Francisco, California. The place got hold of a coffee called Elita Geisha 803, a brew so elusive that only 100 pounds of it were recently sold at auction. A single cup costs 75 bucks, a pound costs 800. It is the most expensive coffee in the world, and it's said to taste smooth and like fruit. Of course, you could just eat fruit and avoid paying the coffee. Even some of the most fervent caffeines would lack the caffons or feel like they've been roasted when dripping a robusta sum of a latte dollars, all ori because the beans were too Americano to be spilled. Some maybe pressed to macchiato more money and filtered the funds to the coffee shop. Others would cap a C. No way for that to mocha sense. Woo! I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10.